Welcome to the second summary video for the regulating substances chapter. Uh, this we're going to cover the video number 9 to number 16 in this video. I'll start with the first one. The first one says outline the role of the hormones aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone ADH in the regulation of water and salt levels in, blo in the blood. So first we'll cover the first one which is the antidiuretic hormone or also known as ADH for short. What it does, it makes the collecting ducts more permeable. And when the collecting ducts become more permeable, what that means is we can reabsorb more water. Um, so the reason why, so we look here, we've got the collecting ducts here. And in, around the collecting duct, so around the collecting duct is a medulla. And that's a concentrated area where um, salt is really concentrated. So high concentration of salt or solute outside. And in the collecting duct, the collecting duct is usually a lower solute concentration. So water would usually flow out from low to high. But these um, collecting ducts are not permeable to water, so they don't let them don't let water pass through. But what ADH does is the ADH actually opens up these collecting ducts, so it, it makes them more permeable. It makes them open up. Once it's op once these um, ducts are open, then water can flow. So if we have too little water in our system, we want to make sure we reabsorb water. And then we release more of this ADH. So once these are open, you're going to have water flowing from low solute to high solute and back into our body. So leaving in the collecting ducts and back into our body. So we've reabsorbed water. So if we have low levels of water, so if we're dehydrated, we're going to produce more ADH, so bring our water levels back up. Whereas if we're overhydrated, obviously we want to make sure that that water leaves for the urine, so we're going to produce less ADH. Right, so that's the whole homeostasis. We've got two mechanisms, two responses in case we have too much or too low. If we've got too much, then we produce less ADH. If we have too little, then we produce more ADH. The other hormone is aldosterone, and that increases our salt reabsorption back into our blood vessels. So it increases our salt reabsorption from our kidneys back into our blood. And what that does, it makes our concentrations of salt or solute really high in our blood compared to the kidneys. And if you remember, if you have osmosis, which is water traveling from a low solute to high solute, if we pump salt back into our blood vessels, that means water will follow. So water follows the salt. And what that does, it increases our water levels in our blood. So what you can imagine here, we've got our blood vessels here. At the moment, we've got this much blood. But if we produce this hormone aldosterone, we will increase that. So now we have increased our blood volume because water has followed salt into our blood. Uh, and that increases our blood volume and also our blood pressure. So if we have low blood volume or low blood pressure, we will increase our aldosterone production to bring that back up to normal. Whereas if we have too high blood volume, obviously we want to make sure we don't produce aldosterone because that would make it even higher. So again, that feedback mechanism, we've got two scenarios. If we have it too low, we increase our aldosterone production. If we have it too high, we decrease our aldosterone production. Now, this one, uh, this dot point says, present information to outline the general use of hormone replacement therapy in people who cannot secrete aldosterone, so who cannot produce aldosterone. Uh, Addison's disease, that was a disease for people who cannot secrete aldosterone, so remember that name. And if you remember, all, the adrenal gla gland produces aldosterone that is situated above the kidney. But in Addison's disease, that adrenal gland doesn't work properly. So if the adrenal gland doesn't work properly, that means we have no aldosterone being produced which means we can't regulate our blood pressure or blood volume anymore because aldosterone was important for blood, blood volume and blood pressure regulation. So instead, what we can do is we can eat this uh, medication called fludrocortisones. It's this medication here. And what happens when we eat that? It is absorbed into a bloodstream. So now these yellow dots is the medication. And if you think about this medication, it does exactly the same thing. So it increases blood volume and blood pressure. It has the same effect as aldosterone, so it basically replaces it almost one for one. So if we have no aldosterone, we'll just eat this medication instead. But we do have to make sure that we monitor our blood volume and our blood pressure, because if we eat too much medication, that means our blood volume and blood pressure will go too high. Right? So the one side effect, the one bad thing about having, eating this medication is that we have to constantly monitor the blood volume and blood pressure levels to make sure that everything is okay. Then we, this stop point says, compare and explain the differences in urine concentrations of terrestrial mammals, marine fish, and freshwater. So first you have, we have to compare and explain. So compare, um, first of all, saltwater and freshwater. In a saltwater fish, they're going to produce concentrated urine, 
whereas the freshwater fish will produce dilute urine. Now that was the compare, but then we have to also explain why. So if you look at the brown dots here, the brown dots are meant to be your solute. And in salt water, obviously you're going to have much more salt in the water itself than in the fish. And remember, water travels from a low solute to high solute. So in this case, you're going to have water traveling from the fish into the ocean around it or into its environment, which means uh, this fish would become dehydrated, it would shrivel up. So it's going to have not going to have much water because it's going to lose water to the environment. And to make sure that it doesn't shrivel up, one way that it can make sure that it doesn't lose too much water is by producing very concentrated urine. So I've drawn that yellow stream, very concentrated. So it's going to be two small amounts, small amounts, and they're going to be concentrated to make sure that they don't dehydrate. Whereas a freshwater fish, it's going to live in an environment where its internal environment is more salty than the ocean or the river, actually the river uh, around it. So it's going to have water going from low solids, so from the river, into the fish. So what's going to happen if nothing is changed? It's going to become really big. It's going to blow, burst basically. Um, and to make sure that that out doesn't happen, these fish produce a large amount of urine and that urine is dilute. So large plus dilute urine. So here we've got that stream of, of water and that's to make sure that the fish actually gets rid of all that extra water it keeps absorbing for the environment. And we also need to look at the mammals. So the mammals, there can be two scenarios. I've, got, I've just drawn a random mouse in a desert kind of an environment. So in one example, it has this uh, mammal has access to not much water, so it might just be a small pond of water somewhere. So it's going to produce concentrated urine, and the mammal that uh, is close to a huge pond of water will produce dilute urine in most cases. And the reason why is because one mouse, mouse number one, which has low water, um, can't drink too much water. So it's going to produce concentrated urine, small amounts of concentrated urine to make sure it can conserve water. Whereas the one that has lots of access to lots of water, it'll drink a lot. So it might have too much water, so it's going to produce large amounts of dilute urine to get rid of all that water again. Right? So compare and explain. So compare the different concentrations and explain why they happen as well. You also need to look at the nitrogenous waste. Nitrogenous waste was just uh, either ammonia, urea, or uric acid. So the form of nitro uh, nitrogenous waste is the breakdown of protein, but the form is either ammonia, urea, or uric acid. So explain the relationship between the conservation of water and the production and excretion of concentrated nitrogenous waste. So ammonia uh, for gills, so uh, for the fish here, this fish lives in a various uh, kind of watery environment, aquatic environment. And with ammonia, the problem with ammonia is we're really poisonous. So we can't keep water in our body for long because it will kill us quite quickly. Uh, but the, the pro point is that it costs little energy to produce. So we don't waste too much energy if we produce ammonia. For the fish, that's good because what the fish can do is it can produce ammonia. And as soon as it produces ammonia, what it can do is it can just get rid of it for the gills. So these are the gills. It can get make it and get rid of it. Make it and get rid of it. Right, so it, even though it's poisonous, it's not going to stay in the body for long, so it's fine. Whereas for a mammal, um, it produces urea. Because the advantage is that it's less poisonous, which is good. The disadvantage is that it costs more energy. But really, a mouse can't afford to urinate constantly. It has no gills to get rid of the ammonia. And it can't afford to urinate constantly, which it would have to do to get rid of that poisonous ammonia. So what it's going to do instead is it's going to produce urea, which you can keep in its bladder for a bit longer because it's less poisonous, and get rid of it when it has to urinate. Um, but the negative is it's more energy. But the mouse has no option. It has to do that. And then we have the ant, which is a insect. And ants and birds produce uric acid. So the advantage, the good point about, about uh, uric acid is that it's not poisonous at all and that it costs no water to, there's no water loss when to remove it. We have to urinate urea, or we don't have to urinate uric acid. So we don't lose water when we produce uric acid. But the bad point is that it costs lots and lots of energy to produce. But an ant has almost no access to energy, to very little access to water, so it has no real alternative. It has to produce something which is not poisonous and requires no water loss because it'll have to hold on to it for quite some time. So this actually, like the uric acid actually sometimes gets stuck to its skin or its skeleton, but it's fine because it's not poisonous. Yeah, the only disadvantage is that they require lots of energy. To compare the expanded relationship between conservation of water and the production and excretion of concentrated nitrogenous waste. So the more 
they have to conserve water, the more uh, they're going to go for a form of nitrogenous waste that conserves water. Right? So urea conserves more water than ammonia, and uric acid conserves even more water than urea. We need to compare the fine enantiostasis and um, explain why high salt levels are bad. If you remember what an estuary was, estuary was something that we have, if we have if we have an ocean and a river hitting at one point, like the place where they're hitting, the place where they're meeting, we will have, during low tide, we will have a animal. So this animal might be the part in brown here. This animal during low tide might be in the river, but when high tide comes, if it doesn't move, it's going to be in the ocean. So it's going to be in a salty. So first it's going to be a non-salty environment in the river, which is fresh water, and then it's going to be in a salty environment in the ocean, which is a saline environment. Saline means just salty. Right, so it's going from non-salty to salty, and that might be a fluctuation that happens in one single day, constantly happens. So this um, organism or this animal is exposed to high fluctuations of salt. And why is that bad? Because too high fluctuation of salt can denature enzymes, right? So too, too high salt levels or too low salt levels in an organism can denature enzymes. It can also do other things, like um, we can cause problems with osmoregulation, so with water balance, but it will also denature enzymes. So there's two ways we can deal with that. We can do homeostasis or enantiostasis. Remember, homeostasis was where we had responses. So if we have our salt levels being too low, maybe like they might be doing low tide, then we would have a response to bring them back up. And if it's too high, like during high tide, then there might be a response to bring it back down. So it keeps, it regulates an internal environment by having these responses to bring our salt levels to this optimum group. M level, which I drew in green here. Right, so that's homeostasis. What in antistasis is a bit different. Uh, in antistasis doesn't regulate its salt levels, so you can imagine this white line being salt levels. It's going to be low during low, during low tide because it's going to be fresh water, and it's going to be really salty inside during the high tide times because now the animal is in the salt um, area, and its internal environment is going to be whatever the external environment is going to be. So if the um, ocean is going to be low, in terms of salt, if, if its environment is going to be low in salt, it's going to be low in salt. Where if its environment is high in salt, it's going to be high in salt. But the problem is that would kill the enzyme. So what it does, it does something else. So if one thing is compromised, then another thing has to compensate for it. So in this case, it's actually going to change its pH. So it's going to look a bit like this. Its pH is going to change to make sure that uh, if the salt levels are high, the pH is low. And that kind of you can imagine it like a compensation effect. So now these two means that it's back to its ideal level in terms of enzyme function. All right, so nantiostasis doesn't regulate its internal levels directly, but through this second mechanism, they can bring it back down or bring it back to a good level where you have normal function happening. And quite a few animals are enantiostasis. They do enantiostasis, they don't do homeostasis. Then we have ways that we can do salt regulation. So remember, um, we need to remove salt because too much salt could mean that we have um, our enzymes not working properly. So there's three different ways. These are the mangrove trees. So mangrove trees might often be in an environment which is salty during, the, during one time, during high tide, and non-salty during the low tide. So it has to have ways to deal with all that salt that it uh, is exposed to. So these are three me mechanisms. We have mechanism number one here which could be that you have salt, which is drawn here in pink, come into the tree, it's absorbed into the tree, travels to the leaf, but at the leaf there's a salt gland. What the salt gland actually does, it ejects salt. So all this, all this salt is removed again. It's kind of spat out by the leaf, right? To make sure its salt levels remains normal. So that's adaption number one. You've got the salt glands and leaves, which eject salt. And number two is if you have your salt being absorbed, and then, but into the leaf in one specific area, so you might have this area becoming really heavily exposed to salt and become really salty. But once it's too salty, what actually happen is what will actually happen is you're going to have these leaves dropping. So the salty leaves, like these ones, are just going to die off and they're going to drop into the ocean. And the salt that has so there's the part of the plant, that part of the tree that has too much salt, it will just get removed and everything's going to be fine again. All right. So the second mechanism was dropping its leaves. The third mechanism was simply uh, blocking the absorption of the actual salt. So these roots don't let the salt in. So it's going to try to come in, but it's not going to be let in because there is a blockage happening at the, at the roots itself. Right? So 
you're not going to have these salt particles actually be able to enter. So these are the three mechanisms, I would remember them, and they were done by the mangrove tree. Then describe adaptations of range of terrestrial Australian plants that assist in minimizing water loss. What I've done is that, you know, this one and the next one, the pointer on with this one slide because they're all the same. They have to do with Australian plants and assisting in minimizing water loss, their adaptions. So we have one, which is the waxy cuticle, and the waxy cuticle is, is uh, eucalyptus trees have waxy cuticles in their leaves. Right? So remember the adaption, but also remember the plant that it does. So a eucalyptus tree does the, has a waxy cuticle. And so you can imagine usually you have these blue dots which are meant to be water. Usually they can come through the leaf and be evaporated, transpirated. But in this case, this waxy cuticle, because water doesn't, can't penetrate fat, which is wax, it can't go through. So it's going to stay inside because of that waxy cuticle. That's one way we can minimize water loss wax cuticle. Another way was um, we have narrow leaves, so remember narrow leaves are the ones which um, if you have broad leaves you're going to have more evaporation happening compared to narrow leaves. So you're going to have some evaporation happening on both, but because narrow leaves have less surface area, which means less water is going to be on the surface, you're also going to have less evaporation happening on narrow leaves compared to on broad leaves. We also have the, uh, and these are also, so eucalyptus trees also have narrow leaves. Um, and we have the vertical hanging leaves compared to the horizontal hanging leaves. So again, you can imagine this leaf and the sun rays hitting this leaf and this leaf. So on one leaf, only the top part is going to be exposed. So you might have this water molecule evaporating or yeah, transpirating. Whereas in the other one, you're going to have all of them being lost. So this is another adaption that eucalyptus trees have to try to minimize water loss. They have their leaves are hanging vertically as opposed to horizontally. And last but not least, we have the spinifex which has kind of roll up its leaves during really sunny and hot times. And you can imagine these are, this is normal when it's not rolled up. The sun is going to hit it completely, and each of these is going to evaporate. Whereas if it's rolled up, you're going to have some evaporation happening. But the parts that are rolled up, you're not going to have any evaporation happening. And so these will all evaporate. Whereas in the rolled one, you only have the ones which are actually exposed, not the ones which are rolled up. And the plant that does it is a spinifex, a spinifex grass, which is also Australian. So remember the adaptions, and remember the names of the plants that have the adaptions. I would remember eucalyptus trees because they have really good ones to remember. The wax cuticles, the narrow leaves, and the vertically hanging leaves. And maybe also the rolled up leaves that from the spinifex grass. But yeah, you can take whichever one you want, just make sure you remember a couple. So I hope that helped.